A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens Stave 4 The Last of the Spirits Part 1 of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You are about to show me shadows of the things that have not happened but will happen in a time before us. Is that so, spirit? Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any spectre I've seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and I hope to live to be another man from what I was. I am prepared to bear your company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? Lead on. The night is waiting fast and it is precious time for me, I know. Lead on, spirit. I know these men. I do business with them frequently. Why am I not privy to these discussions, Spirit? No, I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. Why, what was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows. Well, what has he done with his money? I have heard. Left it to his company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me. That's all I know. <laughs> it's likely to be a very cheap funeral. <laughs> Upon my life, I don't know of anybody to go to it. Yeah. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. Oh, I don't mind going if a lunch is provided, but I must be fed. <laughs> <laughs> I'd offer to go, if anyone else will. When I come to think of it... I'm not at all sure that I wasn't his most particular friend, for we used to stop and speak whenever we met. Anyway, I must be off and doing. Bye-bye. Spirit, who is it these men speak of? Why does another man stand in my accustomed corner? When I look to the clock, I notice it's my usual time visiting the exchange. Couldn't have met me in a better place. Come into the parlour. Stop till I shut the door of the shop. Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. No man more so. Why then, don't stand staring like you was afraid, woman. We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose. No, indeed. We should hope not. Anyway... Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. (laughs) No, indeed. If he wanted them after he was dead. Wicked old screw. Why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? hmm? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with the death. Instead of lying gasping out his last there, alone, by himself... It's a judgment on him. Now, now, let's see what we have here. I wish it was a little heavier, and it should have been. You may depend upon it. If I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open the bundle, old Joe. Let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. (laughs) What do you call these? Bed curtains? Yes, I do. And why not? You don't mean to say you took them down, rings and all, with him lying (laughs) there. You were born to make a fortune. (laughs) You'll certainly do it. I certainly shan't hold my hands when I can get anything in it by reaching out for the sake of such a man as he was. I promise you, Joe. 
Oh, don't drop the oil upon the blankets now. His blankets? Well, who else do you think? He isn't likely to take cold without them, I dare say. I hope he didn't die of anything catching, eh? <laughs> Don't you be afraid of that. I ain't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about him for such things, if he did. <laughs> you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find an hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one at that. Oh, they'd have wasted it if he hadn't been for me. What do you call wasting it? <laughs> Putting it on him to be buried in, to be sure. Somebody was fool enough to do it, but I took it off again. If Calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, it isn't good enough for anything. It's quite as becoming to the body. He can't look uglier than he did in that one. I always give too much to the ladies. It's a weakness of mine, and that's the way I ruin myself. If you asked me for another penny and made it an open question, I'd repent of being so liberal and knock off half a crown. Here you go. Accounts settled in full. This is the end of it, you see. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive. To profit us when he was dead. <laughs> Spirit, I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. <laughs> Merciful heaven, what is this? Scrooge recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed and now he almost touched a bed. A bare, uncurtained bed on which, beneath a ragged sheet, there lay a something covered up, which, though it was dumb, announced itself in awful language. The room was very dark, too dark to be observed with any accuracy, though Scrooge glanced around it in obedience to a secret impulse, anxious to know what kind of room it was. A pale light, rising from the outer air, fell upon the bed, and on it, plundered and bereft, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this man. Spirit, I cannot. I beg you, do not force me to withdraw the sheet. Do not make me to withdraw this veil. Spirit, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me. Let us go. I understand you, and I would do it if I could, but I, I have not the power, Spirit. I, I have not the power. If there is any person in the town who feels emotion caused by this man's death, show that person to me, Spirit. A Christmas Carol, adapted, directed, and produced by Paul A.T. Wilson. Scrooge, Oliver Fry, Ghost of Christmas Yet to Come, himself. Man One, Simon Butcher Jones. Man 2, Jay Brewer, Charwoman, Marilyn Bursey, Old Joe, Paul A.T. Wilson, Narrator, Paul A.T. Wilson, Music, David Pudney, Sound Design, Paul A.T. Wilson. Copyright 2021. This production is published under the International Creative Commons Attribution License Version 4.